works. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah. Oh, hello, everybody. Uh, how's it going? Well, today we're going to talk about uh, deploying OpenStack with Ansible, um, and in particular, uh, what we're doing with the OS Ansible deployment project and how Aro is uh, deploying their public cloud using Ansible. So let's, uh, I guess, get started. So a little bit about myself. My name is Kevin Carter. I uh, work for the Rackspace private cloud. I've been working for Rackspace for about four years now. Um, and I'm on the development side of the Rackspace private cloud si house. And this kind of surmises who I am in a nutshell. Uh, but anywho, um, we are uh, attempting to deliver uh, OpenStack to our customers in a, uh, in a very easily and consumable fashion, and Ansible allows us to do that. Um, Curtis? Oh, uh, yeah, and my name's uh, Curtis Colkit. I work at Oro. <coughs> um, we have a public cloud in, uh, based out of Vancouver, actually. I'm actually from Edmonton, so across the mountains uh, in Alberta. And um, yeah, I'm interested in, obviously, OpenStack. That's what I do for a living, basically. Uh, information security, and uh, on Sunday I was programming a film festival for the first time, so that was something new that I was doing on Sunday, and today I'm here talking to you guys, which is also new, so uh, thanks. But I'm just going to let uh, Kevin sort of go through his piece, and I'm going to sit down and I'll come back up for my piece, so thanks. So to start off, you know, I'm going to call out uh, Robert Cathy. I don't know that you're in this room or anything, but uh, this was up on Twitter. Um, and I just kind of want to highlight this is the fact that OpenStack is cloud infra and cloud infra is hard. And uh, there's a lot of people out there who are saying that they're making OpenStack easy or trivial or uh, making OpenStack this, uh, I want to say, this unicorn that is capable of being able to be deployed anywhere for any reason for some magic purpose. And the reality is, is that OpenStack is very difficult. Um, and what we're attempting to do is actually make that process simple, right? We're not, we're not taking away the, uh, the fact that OpenStack is complicated and a whole bunch of different projects that are working together um, and to achieve a common goal, uh, to, to be able to deploy a, a cloud platform. Um, and so our, our end game using Ansible is to make that simple for you, but not to take away functionality of your actual cloud. And so I, just, I saw that quote on Twitter, and I was like, ah, I must put this on the slide. Um, So um, what is OSAD, as we affectionately call it, is the OpenStack Ansible Deployment Project. And we're really about the deployer experience. We want deployers to be able to come into it and use this system or use Ansible to deploy OpenStack in the same way throughout the life cycle of the cloud. Um, I'm using the word vanilla OpenStack, and that's probably taboo in the, in the greater community because a lot of people say that you can't use vanilla OpenStack, but I'm here to tell you that in our project, we are. We are pulling down OpenStack from the upstream Git sources and building it as Python wheels, distributing it throughout the environment, and making it so that you can deploy OpenStack from upstream sources as it was intended by the developers. Um, so no proprietary secret sauce or bits. The, uh, and why we're here, really, is in around 20, or late 2013 or so, uh, we had a bunch of problems with our deployment system. And it wasn't, it wasn't that our old deployment system didn't work. It was just it, it didn't do the things we wanted it to in a consistent basis. So the, we set out to solve those problems, and we wanted to be able to make sure that we could maintain a scalable, stable environment. Um, and again, like I said, a repeatable process throughout the life cycle of the cloud. And so. To talk about some of the problems that we were trying to solve is uh, the first thing we had was packaging problems. Uh, the packaging, uh, whether I, I don't want to call it any one set of packages that were a problem, but uh, they were either out of date or they would update them and they would break in some spectacular way. There'd be a patch in there that uh, you didn't anticipate. Uh, they would have a bunch of out-of-band configuration that was being laid down on the host that you actually didn't account for. Um, some of these out-of-band configs would reference old variables that didn't exist anymore. And while OpenStack doesn't do a lot of config checking when it's loading these uh, configs, if, it, if there was a value in there that uh, is no longer being used or was deprecated or caused uh, some other uh, unknown problem, uh, we wanted to make sure that that you know, no longer affected our deployments. Uh, 
and then broken dependencies, where you would go and add a bunch of compute nodes to an environment, and you'd install a client only to find out that the client was updated and the client has referencing a dependency that actually didn't exist. Um, and so this was, these were problems that we ran into in various, dist uh, various operating systems and various packaging uh, vendors from upstream. And so we knew we needed to solve that problem. The next thing that we had was uh, the, or the deployment tooling, right? And so the maybe sometimes sort of eventually consistent kind of, like uh, we were using the RCB Ops Chef cookbooks and the Stackforge cookbooks and a couple other deployment tools out there. And you would run Chef three times just to make sure that your environment was correct on a deployment. Like that, that was, uh, you, and, and you, you came into it knowing that you had to run Chef three times. Like the first time would create all your certs, the second time would install the packages, and the third time would start the services. And that was something that we didn't want to do anymore. We wanted to start a run and be able to know that it was going to do the right thing the first time. Um, and and very de we needed it to be very deterministic. Um, upgrades. In that eventually consistent sort of kind of model, upgrades became very difficult. Um, you would pull down new playbooks and they would run something that uh, maybe it was supposed to run on the first time, but you knew it did it on the original deployment, but you're not really anticipating it running again, and so an upgrade comes through and uh, destroys a bunch of stuff, and then you have to go and unwind that. Um, and upgrades became really hard. And even if it was an, uh, a rolling upgrade in, let's say, going from one version of Havana to another version of Havana, like the, the, that model just was unacceptable for us. And then it was a steep learning curve. Uh, and if, again, we're, I'm only going to speak about what we were doing with Chef, but the, the Chef DSL is a, a, almost a language on its own. And so you, you have developers who are primarily Python developers, as we are here in the OpenStack community, coming in and you need to know Ruby-ish, but it's uh, the Chef DSL. Unless you're you know, calling a Ruby or a, like calling a, uh, the Chef gem and then you can do all kinds of stuff inside of Chef, uh, the Chef internals or you're calling an execute block and you're running a bunch of bash commands, which then would change the precedence on how things would run. Um, and so the, there was a very steep learning curve to using the existing deployment tools. Um, and the legacy architecture. A lot of the time when people are talking about how they're scaling OpenStack or how they're standing up these architectures. They're running a controller one, controller two model with this floating VIP that would go in between the two and all the services are running on those two controller nodes and then the rest of everything else is a compute node. Um, and maybe there's a network node in there somewhere but a lot of the time they're putting a network on, node on this control node too, uh, in, in the case of using Neutron. And so this VIP failover would cause problems in, as, you, as your environment scaled out, right? And, and you could test VIP failover all you like in your controlled environment because you would test that, yes, when this service would go down and the other service would come back up and everything was happy. But the reason a VIP would fall over in the first place is because everything wasn't happy. Um, and so this, uh, the controller one, controller two model was something that we really struggled with, especially as we were reaching larger scale deployments in our private cloud environment. So what we came up with was uh, we, know we, needed want, or we knew that we needed to go to source. We wanted to go to upstream OpenStack to get rid of packaging problems. Uh, we're building everything in LXC containers so that we can get a lots of service separation um, within the infrastructure itself. And we're using a multi-master architecture and everything is orchestrated by Ansible. So, kind of go into that. So why Ansible, right? That's the big question. There was already all these other tools. Why don't we go fix them? Well, Ansible has a fantastic community. The, the people of upstream Ansible uh, are receptive. They want to listen to what's going on. They know that, they're, that you know, not everything is perfect, and they want to work with the community to fix things. Uh, if you're in the Ansible uh, IRC channel, you know that there's people in there chatting all day long every day. And so there's always somebody who has a question, and actually there are more people who want to answer those questions. Uh, the, so, the community engagement within Ansible itself has been fantastic. Um, the orchestration part of Ansible, Ansible is orchestration. I, I, can, I can orchestrate a complicated set of tasks and I can do that uh, very simply. Uh, and, and that is inherent to Ansible. It's not something that I have to go kind of hack into Ansible. It is a part of what Ansible wants to do for you. And so that was, we knew we needed that or we wanted that. Um, 
Again, there's almost no code in Ansible. Everything is YAML, right? Uh, and you can read it, and it almost looks like English. You have a task, it has a name, the, and the task does a thing, and that thing could be a shell command or call out to some module. And the module name is very you know, descriptive itself. If it's something that's being run inside of an LXC container, the module name for the LXC module is LXC container. Like, so you know exactly what it's doing and why it's doing it, and you can look at that task and, and, and understand what's happening. So that goes to the next point of a very low barrier to entry. Right? Uh, new developers who want to come into uh, being able to deploy OpenStack and use Ansible can pick up these playbooks and roles and, and do everything that they need to do and start contributing in a very, very uh, quick amount of time. Uh, we have actually in our in, uh, OpenStack Ansible IRC channel a couple guys who uh, were told by their bosses that they needed to go deploy OpenStack. Um, they were coming in and they were you know, software developers but had no OpenStack experience. They picked up OpenStack Ansible deployment and were up and running in about a week and they're actually contributing code to us now. So I mean, the, the, the ability to read what we're doing inside of our roles is, is awesome. So why containers? Well, we're treating LXC like more bare metal, right? Uh, we basically want to have an infrastructure that doesn't have a special, uh, a special circumstance for containers. So we're using Ansible, and we're orchestrating all of that using Ansible's native SSH. Uh, so we SSH into all of our containers and configure them, um, and that's all taken care of by uh, the LXC or the LXC module itself. LXC by itself, or native LXC using the user, or user space tools, uh, is compatible with a lot of different network types. I can use bridges and VLANs. I can use bridges and VTH pairs. I can use Mac VLANs. I can uh, use raw physical interfaces and just give it to the straight up container if I wanted to. Um, and so that was amazing for us because we needed to be able to use these containers in an environment that we probably don't own, right? We're, we're as, as the Rackspace Private Cloud, we're going into a customer data center and setting up a cloud. And it's on gear that maybe we help them spec, but it's, again, their gear and their, their network stack. And so we needed to be able to integrate with whatever it was that they were going to provide us. The, um, it also, uh, LXC supports LVM backend. Um, so I can build my containers in logical volumes, um, which is fantastic, because that will provide me file system barriers between every single one of my containers in my host. I can also move that off into its own set of drives. Um, I can take snapshots if I want to work on a container. Um, and I, I, can, I have a lot of capability with that, and it's stable. Our LXC containers, you know, like I said, we're treating them more, like more bare metal. So we can build our containers and know that they're going to do the thing that we've told them to for as long as they need to. But they're disposable resources. So if you know, troubleshoot something for 30 minutes, if it's not doing the thing you want it to do, destroy it and make another one. There's a good state that you can restore, you know, return it back to. You can also artifact it and send it off and over to a some sort of a, like a lab environment and try to figure out what was really going wrong with that environment. Uh, and so uh, LXC has been very stable for us. So what is OSAD? Uh, as we have affectionately named the project, it is the OpenStack Ansible deployment project, which is up on StackForge. Um, again, we're using LXC containers to isolate components and services. And we describe the, uh, the OpenStack services that we're running in the various containers um, as components of the stack itself. We are, again, just pulling OpenStack from the upstream sources. And so we're pulling down Git from git.openstack.org or GitHub. Or if you're in a, uh, inside of a walled garden, you have a, you know, a Git environment that you want to run. Uh, or you can, you can pull your own source code and maybe do your own patches if you absolutely needed to. But the, the, the reality is that our only requirement is that we have access to something that is Git. And so that is a easy to accommodate. Um, it runs on Ubuntu 14.04 currently, um, and we are building it for production. We have no secret sauce either. Um, yeah, I'll just call that out. Uh, everything that we're doing is up on StackForge. And you know, if it's uh, from the Rackspace side of the house, if it's not actually in the, our OpenStack Ansible deployment repo, it's in our R RCB Ops repo, which is open and totally public to the world. So well, we have nothing that we're doing that is uh, secret. Uh, and you could bolt on as much as you want. We have ability to extend what we're doing in OSAD already. Um, if you want different container types, um, 
a different service provider, a different backend, different, actually an entirely different environment where you're lay, how you're laying out your containers. All of that is available to you through the stack itself. And uh, we are trying to keep, keep it simple, stupid, um, throughout, as, we're, as we're going through and building our stack. But more, a KISS is more keep it stable. Uh, anywho, uh, in Ansible, if you're not familiar, Ansible has tasks, and inside of all of our tasks, we are tagging everything. Everything, everything, everything. Um, so as an operator, you can come into your environment, and you, if you need to run one task to reconfigure something because you're, you're tuning it, you can do just that one thing. Um, uh, you can actually string a whole series of tags together and do just those series of things. But this makes it so that I don't have to just keep running, again, chef client until I get my maybe kind of sort of eventually consistent model. I can do the thing that I need to do, and I can do it now. Um, we also are doing process uh, and service separation because of our container architecture. Um, and we are microservice-like where it makes sense. Right? We're not using the Docker model in the sense that we have one PID running in one container, and we have three million containers who are making that all of our stack possible. Uh, you know, uh, our gate job is around 32 containers total. Um, and inside of each one of those containers, if there are services that want or need or like to be tied together to talk to each other within, or talk to the, the same thing with, or within the same namespace, we're going to do that because it makes sense. Um, so a little bit about the stack itself. We are using Galera like so many other people. Um, and that Galera is being powered by MariaDB. Currently, uh, that's MariaDB 5.5 and Galera 3. Um, we're also using RabbitMQ, uh, RabbitMQ 3.4.3, I believe. Um, and we're pulling that down directly out, um, from the, 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 the dev package from uh, upstream RabbitMQ. And I'm calling that out the cheese shop, um, the PyPy index. So when you're using our environment, you are actually getting a, a set of Python wheels, uh, which is that compiled Git source code, uh, which is all running inside of this index in the environment itself, uh, which makes it so that, again, you can deploy the same bits throughout the stack for the entire lifecycle of the cloud. You can also update it when you need to, and those bits will, again, live inside of your environment. Um, it's a very simple index, and it doesn't consume a lot of space. Uh, like the, the Kilo release is um, less than a gig. I think it was like 900 megabytes of uh, Python wheels. Uh, so it's a, a very, very efficient way of delivering the, the, uh, the compiled bits throughout the stack. Currently, uh, like I said, we don't really, are, we're on StackForge, and we're gating it through the OpenStack CI, which means that we get a performance 1.8 or an 8 gig uh, cloud server running on HP cloud or Rackspace cloud. But when we're doing these uh, gate jobs, we are building it as if it was a multi-node cloud. It just happens to be in one, one physical box. Um, we have the amount of containers that we would have in a multi-node cloud. So we're building a three-node Galera cluster, a three-node Rabbit cluster, two Horizon nodes, two Keystone nodes, a three-node repo infrastructure for our cheese shop index. We're trying to essentially make our gate job what you will see in production. Um, and we're using the Linux Bridge agent, which is Linux Bridge and VXLine if you're using L3 networks. Um, OVS is, uh, is actually, you know, it's come a long way from where it used to be. And OVS 2.3 plus is actually, uh, you know, fairly stable and fast. But Linux Bridge Agent just works. So uh, we're, we've been very successful with that. As a community project, we are, um, so we have Juno, Icehouse, and Kilo. Um, and Kilo actually was released on April 30th, six hours after it was announced publicly from the uh, upstream OpenStack sources and the tags were dropped. Um, and since its original release, we've been tracking the head of the uh, stable Kilo branch for our Kilo branch as well. Um, and so in our supported releases, Juno and Icehouse call them out. They contain a whole bunch of Rackspace-isms, right? Because they was moved from our internal project up into StackForge. Uh, we didn't excise those code bits because we were relying on them. Uh, but in Kilo, we did. Uh, so with that, uh, Kilo is our first community release. And as it stands right now, we have 41 contributors, and not all of them are Rackers. Right? Uh, obviously, within the Rackspace private cloud, we're all contributing to this project. Uh, but uh, there are quite a few folks who are not Rackers, and they're contributing to it, which is fantastic, because we're, again, we're trying to build this community around being able to s consistently deploy OpenStack using Ansible. And that seems to be growing. 
to talk about the code difference between Juno and Kilo, um, we have excised uh, you know, 81,000 lines. And if you've been in OpenStack for a while, this is essentially we keystone lighted the repository. Uh, so with that, we ha I mean, we still have a lot of code in there, but there's really only 9,000 lines of, of YAML, right? If I, if I sift through all of the stuff in master right now, there are 9,000 total lines of YAML. And we have a style guide right now that makes the way that we write our tasks as essentially as a dictionary. And so those lines of YAML could probably be compressed into two per task, but we have chosen to write them as like five or six lines so that it's easier to read. Uh, but what powers the stack? Around 9,000 lines of YAML. Um, the rest of it are a couple libraries that we're looking at trying to get upstreamed, um, text files, readmes, and whatnot. But yeah, it's... So to kind of touch back on uh, what we're about, we're about the, you know, the, the deployer experience. We really think that uh, Ansible is a, is a superior way of delivering uh, infrastructure. As, uh, and the, we really want the deployer experience to be a fantastic one. Uh, we're about vanilla OpenStack. I'm going to keep saying that because we are. We're pulling down OpenStack from the upstream sources. Like, there's no proprietary shenanigans happening in the background. It's upstream. The, um, we also want stability and scalability, because why would we build something that wasn't stable? To, I'm going to talk a little bit now about like, uh, how this actually all works. Um, and so within the OpenStack configuration, everything, we do have config files. Again, they're YAML, because uh, we seem to like our YAML. But uh, everything lives in a directory called OpenStack deploy, because we have no originality in the way we name things. Uh, but we're using OpenStack's dynamic inventory. And, or I'm sorry, Ansible's dynamic inventory. And we're generating the inventory itself using the config that's found in OpenStack Deploy. Um, and so this allows you to add more nodes, delete nodes, uh, add uh, ch tune variables and everything else. It's basically the uh, stuff in OpenStack Deploy is your window into uh, the Ansible inventory. Um, and then we created a small little execution wrapper, which is a bash wrapper that is uh, essentially running Ansible playbook dash E and it, it brings in a bunch of all, all of the config within that directory for you. So you can, instead of running Ansible playbook and a huge command, you can actually run just OpenStack Ansible and the playbook you want to run. Um, and so we're trying to make this, again, simpler for the deployer. So if I wanted to actually do the deployment, uh, once I have all the config in place, I don't actually want to show you config on a slide here because it would be kind of ridiculous to look at. But there is, you get into the playbooks directory once you've cloned the source, get into some sort of a terminal, or a terminal multiplexer, and run OpenStack Ansible, set up everything. Because again, we have no originality in the way we name things. Uh, so once it's done, uh, like within our gate job itself, this takes about 40 minutes to do the deploy. Right? And to talk about that, uh, this is what our gate job looks like. And I'm sure uh, our docs writer people are going to hate me for showing this because it's an ASCII diagram. But anyways, uh, there are 32 containers. It is, uh, and there's a load balancer in there using HAProxy. We are deploying Swift. We have Neutron. We have VXLAN and Linux Bridge. There's a lot of stuff going on inside of this all-in-one environment that we're doing within our gate job. But if you, if you take what this is, this is actually what we are doing in production across hundreds of nodes, right? Uh, we can make the, the infrastructure uh, the infrastructure nodes themselves uh, as, as, as big of a control plane as we want it to be, um, that uh, within reason and uh, based on what it are the amount of requests that your private or public cloud are, is going to be receiving. Um, but it kind of looks like this. So from the, for, as a deployer, uh, we're adding compute capacity. So this is kind of what it would be required to add more compute nodes. You go into your config file, you add a couple of references to where you're, you're, these new hosts that you're bringing online, and at a minimum, you need a host name and an IP address. And when you're, when you're done with that, you run set up everything and you limit to your compute group, uh, the Nova compute group. Right, and that will go through everything that needs to be run within your environment and add more compute nodes. Uh, now, compute nodes are trivial, right? That should be the easy one. But what if I wanted to add more control infrastructure? Same thing. I go in, I have different groups for different, for our different 
pieces of the infrastructure itself, which is uh, your identity or infra or your OpenStack infra, or if the, you wanted to scale out your Galera, RabbitMQ, and Memcache, or something of that nature, that would be in your shared group. And then you, again, limit based on those groups. Um, and this will go through and wire up everything within your cloud that affects those new hosts within those groups. Now, the, the non-trivial example is Neutron. Uh, Neutron, what if you wanted to add another network within your Neutron environment for VXLAN, in this case here? Um, I could actually do that by adding a Neutron Networks config file and then have a global override with a provider network that specifies everything else that I need to know about that network itself. And then, again, limiting to the Neutron all command. Right? This will go through all of your containers and wire up your new network. Um, so our roles are intelligent enough to take care of this stuff for you. Um, and it interprets what you have in config, represents that in inventory, and executes. Can you scale up to specific services like Neutron? Yes. So if I wanted to add just, let's say, I wanted to add more network hosts, I certainly could do that. Um, I could all, I, uh, we, have, we have lots of different groups that we can uh, scale out independently from one another. Uh, and actually, there is a blanket, like, I don't want to know what's going on, infra group, and it will just do everything in the one node. So if you just real, wanted to build stacks of everything inside of these one nodes, you certainly could do that too. But if I wanted to actually, uh, scale out just the one neutron thing? Sure. Yeah, that's not a problem at all. Um, and now I'm going to yield the podium to Curtis. Hi. Uh, okay, so I guess basically the, where I'm coming from is as a, a consumer of OSAD and a user of OSAD, and that's kind of the perspective that I'm, I guess I'm bringing to this part of the presentation. Um, so I want, first I want to say thank you to, to Kevin and, and everybody who's been working on the uh, OSAD project because that gives me something that I can go to work with every day and use at my job and, and try to make my work easier and, and actually create a, a really great public cloud. So thank you guys very much for that. Um, so just a quick intro on Oro. Uh, we're, we're based in Canada, obviously, and there are quite a few um, organizations and companies and people in Canada that would like to keep their, um, their data in Canada for various reasons. So that's, in a way, a big driver for uh, our business. Um, in terms of what we're using for OpenStack, uh, we're working on our second generation of our cloud, and that is a fairly uh, stock OpenStack system. I guess Kevin, in a way, was using vanilla. And um, other than the, a big difference is that we're using MetoNet as, as our Neutron plugin. Uh, so what are we using uh, in terms of OSAD? Uh, so right now, not as much as we'd like to, and part of this uh, process, I think, is going to be as OSAD continues to uh, grow and, and be a community project, um, we'll be using more of it uh, as we go along, and that's really my goal is to, in a way, my work will be to like consume uh, OSAD and, and, and add on our additional like proprietary components, but uh, for Right now, we're using all of the, infrastructure, the main infrastructure components anyways that come directly from uh, the OSAD roles, so the Rabbit, uh, Galera, Memcache, all that kind of stuff, so the, the basic infrastructure. Um, we definitely have a lot of thinking to do in terms of the workflow, so I guess I, I'll probably keep repeating this, but uh, one of the things that I'm basically doing is I think my job is gonna be to like, determine how we consume OSAD and what that workflow looks like and how we like layer on top of our custom requirements and things like that. Um, so I also think that OSAD is invaluable as an example. Even if you didn't want to deploy with it, you could totally go in there and look through all the config files and see what uh, production OpenStack system is using. Um, and those config files are really invaluable, I think, uh, and that's a real useful thing to have. Uh, the other thing that we're sort of working towards is um, the team that uh, I'm working with is somewhat new to configuration management, so um, we have a lot of work there to do in terms of being able to properly consume and, and use OSAD and Ansible as well. Uh, so again, OSAD 
you know, great example of not only uh, using Ansible, which is, so there's a lot of great, like, sort of best practice stuff that's in the OSAD stuff and a lot of things you can learn from. There's, like Kevin said, there's 9,000 lines of YAML, which on one, on one hand sounds like a lot, but on the other is just a really great example of using Ansible and how to do it in sort of like a professional production, stable, you know, scalable way. Um, they're also big users of the testing, like the gating with um, the OpenStack infrastructure. So that's something that we really need to like take a look into and see how that's all being done and start to apply that to our own systems. Um, already supporting Kilo, as Kevin mentioned, you know, they were able to deploy Kilo like basically on the day that it was released within a few hours. I think that's a really powerful thing to be able to do because uh, part of what I need to do at work every day is to continuously improve my infrastructure and I need to do that by making lots of small changes really quickly and that I can't really just wait for like uh, packages or the next release or whatever. So we're really hoping to get uh, a lot more use out of that kind of uh, source distribution model and being able to get right into uh, the new stuff right away. Um, let's see, yeah, oh, and the community as well. So uh, not only do we have uh, the OpenStack community, which is great, um, the Ansible community, which is great, but now I can also like uh, ask questions to the people that are working on OSAD and, and also try to help to uh, contribute back there. So I have all these different great communities to work with that make my job a lot easier. Uh, and then finally, the uh, segregation of services model that OSAD is using is really helpful to us and I think is, is pretty important, uh, regardless of what you think of you know, uh, LXC or different types of container technologies, like we're, we're, uh, we definitely want to use that, so uh, really happy that that's in there and uh, that's something that's important to us as well. Uh, so uh, just a couple differences from uh, what I do, like for what Oro provides. So we're, obviously we're a public cloud, so there's, so OSAD is like a, it, typically a private cloud sort of production system, um, but we're public, uh, we're using Metonet. We have a slightly different uh, HA model um, that we're still working on improving. Uh, we also have to do billing, which is something that not a lot of uh, clouds have to do that are using OpenStack because most OpenStack, or many OpenStack uh, deployments are, are private, so you don't really have to worry about billing as much, but we have to do billing, which I think is a really interesting problem. And then our support model might be a little bit different too. We have multiple tiers of support staff, and uh, we have to find ways to uh, include those support staff, you know, and still have a segregation of duties, but allow them to, to do the work that they need to do and uh, be able to run playbooks but not necessarily have access to uh, all of this, the credentials and things uh, that um, so higher tiers might have. Uh, so I, uh, in some ways I have some of my own guiding principles of using Ansible. So these are really my own uh, thoughts and problems uh, that I'm still working on figuring out. So one of the things that I'm not sure about yet is uh, uh, when to re restart servicers, services, so I haven't really settled on the whole handlers concept and whether or not that's great. I don't necessarily want to run an Ansible playbook, have it change a config, and then restart a bunch of services, so that's something I'm still thinking about. Uh, every task tag, so Kevin already mentioned that with OSAD and how that's really a, a powerful system. It's something extra you have to do sort of with the Ansible playbooks, but it's really powerful to be able to only execute certain tasks in a playbook by tagging them. So. Uh, we do that uh, a lot, and also through using tags, I can continuously run uh, playbooks like every half an hour, every hour, uh, either from something like Ansible Tower or Jenkins, I'm using both. And uh, based on those tags, I can run those jobs and have those execute uh, continuously. Um, I also think that installing OpenStack uh, the first time is relatively straightforward, sort of. Uh, <laughs> But uh, then I have to operate that for like the next X number of years. And that's where, like, where I really think that Ansible comes in uh, very helpful is that I need to orchestrate like maintaining that system forever, basically, until we deprecate it. And I've, I've been working in this kind of stuff for a long time and I haven't deprecated that many systems. So, <laughs> um, and again, like I said, to do lots of small changes faster. And then of course, you know, we, even though Ansible uses SSH, we don't really want people SSHing into boxes and doing stuff manually, so uh, we'll use Ansible to execute whatever work they need to do. Uh, so I have a few personal struggles too with Ansible, uh, and again, it's not necessarily something that's wrong with Ansible, it's just that in some cases it's a little bit too powerful and it's easy for me to make uh, silly mistakes. So um, 
For example, there's a lot of idempotent modules, but then I can easily add like a shell script and, and mess all those up. Um, and then I can say it changed when never, uh, because I never like to see all the changes and be just like, oh, well, just changed when never, or false, you know, and then you never, uh, it always appears like nothing happened, even though that shell command or that other command could have totally done something. Um, multiple environments, I haven't totally figured out how to do multiple environments. I have one way that I'm working with it now, but that's something I'm really interested in figuring out. And then finally, um, you know, the Ansible reboot all, uh, which I don't know if anybody's ever done, but uh, I've seen a few examples on the internet of the same sort of concept where it's pretty easy to do that. Uh, but in a way, because Ansible is so powerful, right? Uh, so in the near term, uh, with our deployment, we want to be able to deploy OpenStack from source, so we'll consume that model from OSAD segregation of services. Again, OSAD is gonna help us with that. We need additional monitoring. Who doesn't need more monitoring? Um, Ansible callback plugins, I find those to be really interesting because I'd like to know when a, when a job creates changes or causes changes, and in order to find that out, one of the ways I've been doing that is to have a callback plugin that says, okay, that when this playbook ran, it caused a change, and that goes into our Slack channel and then lets me know that there was an actual change uh, when, a, when one of the automated jobs runs. Um, I need to learn a lot more about the OpenStack uh, infrastructure and how testing is done there because that's how I'm gonna be able to operate uh, our OpenStack cloud over time is by doing a lot of testing. And then I could really use a couple modules, uh, specifically Metonet and Swift for doing some backup stuff. Um, so finally, or some comments, ideas. Uh, how is how are we going to consume OSAD? Like, how do we make it pluggable? Whatever pluggable means. Like, how do I layer my custom requirements on top of that? You know, what kind of HA model can we sort of insert into OSAD? And can I use? Um, you know, I'd like to get to some sort of ECMP BGP style load balancing. How do I balance uh, community roles and playbooks with our custom requirements? And then, you know, like that whole process is about how do we consume uh, OSAD and stick it into our workflow and processes. Uh, so, some thoughts I've had about configuration management in the future and using Ansible is I have a real hard time with secrets like uh, passwords and stuff like that. How do we properly do that when you have so many variables? Where do those variables come from? How do I store secrets properly and uh, avoid the whole like, oops, I checked it all into uh, Git? Uh, now what do I do? <laughs> um, continuous integration, uh, you know, like uh, a lot of our, like I said, a lot of our stuff is gonna be running from Ansible Tower or Jenkins or both, so how does that work in? And um, caching of uh, dynamic inventories, I think Kevin was mentioning there's gonna be some work in dynamic inventories, where does that information come from? Um, what is the future of config management? I don't know, um, but it's gotta be more than just installing packages, setting up a config file, uh, starting services and then like occasionally some bootstrap stuff. And then uh, for a big part of having a public cloud and having to deal with things like ITIL and stuff like that is some sort of change management process. So how do I use Ansible to uh, provide, you know, to, to work with that sort of change management workflow and figure that out? Yeah, so I guess Kevin will come back up here and um, finish this off. Is this thing on? Yeah. So now just to kind of uh, build on to what Curtis was talking about is where do we go from here, right? That's, uh, we want to increase the community participation within OSAD itself, right? Uh, that's what communities want. We want to grow. We want to make everything better. We think it's pretty good now, but we know it can be better. Uh, uh, so pull requests are welcome. If, if there's a bug, fix it. Uh, the, um, we also want to build out more of the operational modules. We're carrying a few modules in our stack currently, uh, whether that be for Neutron or Glance or something like that, and we think that, that's, that that code lives in core Ansible. And we've had some you know, uh, conversations in the Ansible collaboration day that we had yesterday about how we're going to do that and, and how we can you know, move some of that functionality into the upstream code so everybody can consume it in a, in a more, uh, more organized fashion. Um, like Curtis said, um, the dynamic inventory, uh, having multiple backends, right? Uh, Ansible's inventory is historically a static file or some custom database somewhere that, uh, that you set up yourself. And uh, we think that there's some improvements that we can make in that space. And you know, where do we go from here? Well, uh, we don't know all the answers to that question yet, but uh, it's gonna be a journey and we think that, uh, we'd love for people to come along with us. So you know, to open that up, 
you guys have questions? And hopefully we have answers. And if you have a question, step up to the mic. There. Hey. I have a question about um, how you manage uh, different sources for different pieces of the stack. So let's say you've deployed Kilo, mm -hmm. and you find that Kilo is critically broken in a way that affects you, and you want to actually pull a change set from Garrett and deploy that. How do you do that? So if it was a change set from Garrett and wasn't merged at that time, yes. uh, we, we don't have a, a good way of doing that yet. Okay. But the so. Git source itself lives on the repo servers, uh, and so you can go check that out. Um, sure. We don't have an automated way of doing that. Okay, but so you can you can at least have a separate Git source for each component then, so you can say, I want to pull heat from my local Git repository and everything else from the git.openstack. Yes, yeah, you can totally do that. Okay. Um, and you can, you can do it on a tag, branch, name, or SHA. And actually what we have upstream is all SHA-based. Okay. Yeah. And one last quick question. Can sure. it run, can it pull configuration from something, from somewhere other than Etsy OpenStack deploy? Yes, yes you can. Um, so the OpenStack Ansible wrapper will source what's inside of OpenStack Deploy, but if you have additional config that you want to put somewhere or encrypt using Ansible Vault, you can pass those values to it, no problem. I, I'm not, I'm, let's, I guess the question was more along the lines of I'm not, I'm not root, I'm not storing anything in Etsy, I'm storing it in a local directory other than Etsy. Can I, say, can I tell Ansible Deploy, Deploy, use this directory as your source of everything? Uh, yeah, actually you could do that. Uh, you would have to make two changes. One would be in the dynamic inventory pie that we're carrying, and the other one would be in the OpenStack Ansible wrapper. Okay. And those would, you just point at those two locations. Okay. Yes. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Uh, there are at least two t-shirts going around now that say, but it worked in DevStack. Yes. Um, which is one of the top three reasons that I as a developer hate DevStack. Yes. Um, and I know you said I have that, that shirt. I love that yeah, shirt. <laughs> that OSAT doesn't have, it doesn't currently understand the all-in-one deployment. Are there plans, like I know obsoleting DevStack is a holy war, but are there plans to sort of creep into that arena so that I can deploy OSAT locally and develop on it and I don't have to tell my operations guys it worked in DevStack, I could say it worked in OSAT? Yes. Uh, I won't say that we're encroaching on any of the DevStack territory because I don't want to be, you know, put up on a crucifix somewhere. But uh, I, I will say that there are people who are doing that, and um, some, of our, some of the people who work for Rackspace are actually doing that now, and I, I actually saw a blog post, it was up on Reddit the other day, about a couple of the Horizon devs who are doing that, and how they're doing that, by standing up a, um, an OSAD-powered cloud on a single node, deploying no Horizon containers, and then doing Horizon work locally. Um, and then I've seen a, a couple of things like that using Glance as well. But yeah, I, I, can, I can talk to you a little bit more about that offline if you'd like. But yes, the answer is yes. If you have any further questions, just take them directly to the presenters. Thank you. <laughs>